everybody. My name is Angel Kane and I'm the park naturalist here at Smith Goldwood State Park. And today I want to talk to you about stream ecology. Stream ecology is one of my favorite activities we do here at the park. So when I say stream ecology, the word ecology basically means that we're studying the organisms found in the stream and the way that they interact with each other. We also look at how those organisms actually impact the environment around them as well. So the goal of stream ecology is actually to determine the health of Duke's Creek. If you'll look behind me, you'll see Duke's Creek. Duke's Creek is one of the top 100 trophy trout streams in the United States. So we have fly fishermen from all over coming to fish here. So when we have fishermen coming to catch these big trout, we want to make sure that we're keeping checks on the water levels as well as the trout's health to make sure that conditions are still favorable for these trout. Trout require very cold, clear, fast moving, and highly oxygenated water. So when we talk about the health of a stream, we look at two different things. We look at abiotic and biotic factors. Abiotic factors are any non-living factors that affect the stream. This can be anything like temperature and sunlight, pH, and even the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water. Biotic factors, on the other hand, are any living factors we find in the stream. So this would be things like plants, amphibians, and even trout. But because no one really wants to watch me go down here and try to catch trout for the next hour, that's not really the most efficient way to determine the health of the stream. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at what the trout are eating in order to determine not only the health of the trout, but the health of the stream as well. Trout eat macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates are small organisms that do not have a backbone, but they are large enough to be seen with the naked eye. These macroinvertebrates live on the bottom of the stream in the benthic zone underneath rocks and things like leaf litter. Throughout the year, these macroinvertebrates not only help to feed trout, but they also help to scavenge on dead and decaying plant and animal matter. Trout, along with macroinvertebrates, require very high dissolved oxygen levels in the water. So if you don't have macroinvertebrates in the stream, then you won't have trout in the stream. So if these macroinvertebrates are found on the bottom of the stream, how are we going to get them off? Here at Smith Gall Woods State Park, we use a kick seine net. This is a kick seine net. At the bottom of the net, you will see a thick white strip. It's important to note this because this part of the net will always go on the bottom of the stream. The top of the net has a thinner white strip, so this lets you know to always keep that on the top. Then what we do is we go out in the stream and put the thick white band on the bottom. We take a few medium sized rocks to hold the net to the bottom of the stream. Now since a lot of you guys probably don't have a seine net at home, you can easily make one by using two broomstick handles and a bed sheet. All you have to do is tie the bed sheet to the handles and go out in the stream. Now I'm actually going to show you how the kick seine process works. Keep in mind that if you go and look for macroinvertebrates on your own at home, you always need to do so with a buddy. Here you can see that I brought along my friend Miss Kathy Church in order to help me look for macroinvertebrates. Here you can see that she's filling the bucket halfway full of water so that these macroinvertebrates will have a comfortable place to hang out while we search for more. Now she is placing rocks at the bottom of the seine net to keep the net against the bottom of the stream while she grinds her feet around. Here she begins to grind her feet around up and down to look for macroinvertebrates on the bottom of the stream. As she grinds her feet back and forth she will actually kick these macroinvertebrates up and they will be caught in the same net that I am holding. Once we get a good sample we will fold the net up hot dog style and carry it onto shore. We will then begin to pick through what we caught and look for any macroinvertebrates that might be present. When you are looking for macroinvertebrates, you don't need to be more than about an ankle deep in water. So if you are waist deep or even knee deep, you are way too deep to be finding any kind of macroinvertebrates. If you don't have access to 
a sane net or you can't create one, flipping rocks is a good alternative to finding macroinvertebrates. So when you walk around and flip rocks, you just want to make sure that you always flip the rock back toward yourself. We flip rocks toward ourselves for our safety and to allow animals to safely escape. Walking around the stream edge is not only a good place to find rocks to flip for macroinvertebrates, but it's a good place to find all kinds of reptiles and amphibians. Just remember that if you do go out and look for critters, that this is their home, and so you want to be respectful. Always make sure to flip rocks back to the original location that you found them in. You wouldn't want someone to come in your home and leave your house a wreck, so make sure that you flip all rocks back over. Moving around rocks in a stream can seriously devastate the stream ecosystem, so make sure you leave it as you found it and respect nature. Within about five minutes, Miss Kathy and I found all kinds of cool critters. After we finished looking for macroinvertebrates, we made sure to return everything we caught back into the water. Here you can see me rinsing out the same net so that it is ready to go for the next time. After I rinsed out the net, I then gently dumped all the macroinvertebrates we caught back into the water. Now I want to talk to you about how different types of macroinvertebrates can help us determine the health of a stream. Scientists use what is called the Water Quality Index Score to determine the health of a stream. They look at the different species of macroinvertebrates caught in a sample and then place them into different groups based upon their sensitivity to pollution. There are three groups. Group 1 is the sensitive group. Group 2 is the somewhat sensitive group. And group 3 is the tolerant group. So now I want to show you some of the macroinvertebrates that you would find in a stream. Let's start with the macroinvertebrates that are the most sensitive, or group 1. This is a crawling mayfly. They get the name mayfly because adults often emerge in the month of May. Mayfly nymphs can be identified because of the three tails present at the end of the abdomen. A nymph is the juvenile form of the adult. The photo in the top left is the adult form of the mayfly. This is a spring stonefly. They get the name spring stonefly because adults often emerge during spring or summer. Stonefly nymphs can be identified by the two tails present at the end of the abdomen. A lot of the time it can be difficult to distinguish between mayflies and stoneflies. One easy way to remember the difference between the two is to remember that the month of May has three letters. There is one letter for each tail that the mayfly has. In the bottom right corner, you will see the adult form of the stonefly. The last organism in group one that I would like to discuss is the helgramont. Helgramonts are among the largest of aquatic insect larvae. The long orange filaments along the abdomen help the helgramont take up dissolved oxygen from the water. Adult helgramonts are called dobson flies. The picture in the bottom right corner is a male dobson fly. Males have long tusks coming off the head that help to attract a mate. Next I'm going to talk about some of the organisms that you would find in group 2, or the somewhat sensitive macroinvertebrates. This is a water penny. You can identify a water penny because of their brown, flattened body. The picture on the left shows the top view of the water penny. The photo on the right shows the bottom view. Just like a sand dollar, water pennies have tiny little legs that help them to move around. This is a crane fly. Crane fly larvae can be found in aquatic, semi-aquatic, and terrestrial environments. A lot of people think that the adult form of the crane fly resembles a mosquito. But crane flies do not bite or feed on blood. They will actually feed on the nectar that is created by flowers. Lastly, I'm going to talk to you about some organisms that you would find in group 3, or the tolerant macroinvertebrates. The picture on the left is a giant water bug. They spend most of their time underwater and can actually form an air bubble next to their body which can help them obtain oxygen while still underwater. The picture on the right is a water strider. 
They spend most of their time on the surface of the water. They have special little hairs on their legs that allow them to skate and slide across the surface of the water without ever breaking the surface. A lot of the organisms that Miss Kathy and I caught were in group 1, the sensitive group. Because we caught mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, which are the most sensitive to pollution, this lets me know that we have excellent water quality here in Dukes Creek. If we had a lot of pollution and low dissolved oxygen, we wouldn't have found all these macroinvertebrates in group 1. Because we found all these macroinvertebrates, this lets me know that there is plenty of food for the trout. Keep in mind that when catching macroinvertebrates, having a large variety is more important than the quantity, or the overall number that you catch. Scientists will actually sample a stream four times a year with the changing seasons to get a good idea of what is going on with the water quality throughout the year. Every body of water will contain different types of macroinvertebrates. Using the tips in this video, get out in the stream for yourself and search for these small but important organisms and see which ones you can find and identify.